Hey, future visionaries. Are you ready to track objects like a pro using PyTorch and TensorFlow? In the next 15 or less minutes, we're going to dive deep into the world of computer vision. It's going to be a wild ride, so buckle up and let's get started. This is video 19 out of 20 in our beginner series and introduction to AI. By the end of the series, you'll be ready to learn more advanced concepts of AI and machine learning, which will allow you to elevate your career in tech and remain in demand on the job market. All right, so first things first, what exactly is object tracking? Well, it's sort of like playing hide and seek with pixels. We follow objects as they move in video frames. Now let's see how we can be the Sherlock Holmes of our digital world. So first, let's set up our detective toolkit. You'll need, as you can see below, um, the CV2 library, Torch, NumPy, um, and Matplotlib, as well as a few other libraries. So follow along as I install them. Now to give you some context, you'll actually observe that import torch, import torch actually imports the Python library. And you'll also see that the section here from torchvision.models.detection import faster RCNN ResNet 50 FPN is actually importing the faster RCNN model with the ResNet 50 backbone from Torch Vision's model zoo. Likewise, by setting that model um, in this next section here to pre-trained equal to true, the value of doing so is that it sets the model into a state where we're using the model that has just been simply trained or pre-trained on a standard data set. Likewise, model.eval sets the model to evaluation mode. That step is necessary because this means that we disable layers like dropout and batch normalization, which will behave differently during training. You'll also notice that there is a copious amount of information that gets output when you run this cell. And that specifically walks through the underlying architecture of the imported neural network. Outputs like open paren conv1, or as you can see, bn, um, indicate what the subsequent layer is doing. For example, conv1 is a two-dimensional convolutional layer, and the output specifies both the kernel size, the stride, and the Boolean value associated with having bias. Likewise, bn1 indicates that a form of batch normalization was performed, and it also indicates that this layer is expecting an input of, in this case, 512 channels or features. We'll dive into these details in my intermediate class, which you can find online. But now that you've executed this cell, let's move on to the next section. Here, we can simply store our .mov or .mp4 file to the video path. Make sure that you have the desired .mov or .mp4 in the same directory as a cell block. This cell just stores your video in the video variable on the second line. Okay, so to just like sort of prepare you, although it's going to output nothing, to give you a little bit of the about, this basically renders the video um, for use in the following cell. Um, to give you context, this was a video that I took at one of my friend's weddings the morning after the ceremony. So we were in NorCal near Carmel Beach, and I saw this swarm of birds flying and I just thought this was so beautiful. So I'm going to run this cell. And a little anticlimactic, you don't see anything just yet because we're going to do one more step. And if you go back to our other videos, you'll remember that we imported things known as label maps. Think of it like this. Every detective needs their trusty toolkit. And here we actually have our label map, which is like a secret decoder ring that translates numbers into objects like cat or dog or mysterious shadow. And aha, uh -huh, our main clue, the video file, is cunningly named here. And so since we named that video path, we're going to simply import our Coco labels. And then this is where the meat of our function actually runs. So before we jump through it, let me actually explain the code. Um, so that way this makes sense and you're not just blindly running us out. So the first element that you really want to consider here is that, again, I traditionally love to sort of just like put this magic time line so that way you can see how long it takes for the model to run in the way that you compose your code. Um, when you go down here, this section is simply calculating the frame rates and setting up that frame limit. So you'll notice here that I basically set it up for five seconds worth of frames. I then initialize the frame count. We start at zero. 
And then we begin to peek into each frame of our movie and we hunt for objects. That gets instantiated when we begin this while video dot is opened and frame underscore count is less than the frame limit. In other words, the way to think about this is like you're looking through a flip book, but instead of having stick figures, we're looking at real life video feeds. And so what you're essentially doing is you're going frame by frame. As you can see here, we even iterate with frame plus equal to one. And what we do is we execute this entire algorithm here. And what is actually happening? Well, I sort of commented it out for clarity, where first we're actually converting the color space from BGR to RGB, which we described why you do that in earlier videos. And then we actually converted the frame um, into an underlying tensor and save it to the frame tensor variable. Then this is actually where we store, we use the stored model um, and then we actually pass as input these frame tensors. So this is the, where the magic happens, where removing again the gradient descent element using with torch dot no grad, we then execute the algorithm. And then we finally end up here by producing predictions. After you create predictions, you can then extract those underlying outputs because in the predictions tensor, there will actually be boxes, labels, and scores that accompany each one of these elements. Think of it like this. In a high-tech lab, we transform each frame into a tensor, a fancy word for a multidimensional array. And sort of like flattening a Rubik's cube, this lets us model um, our underlying data and it allows you to peer into the data and make predictions with your all-seeing eye. And finally, this bottom part here is probably not the most exciting, but this is actually where the magic is happening. So what, basically what's happening is we're drawing these green boxes around our detected objects, which you'll see when I articulate, you know, CV dot rectangle. Um, and what's going on is that they're not just any box. They're actually bounding boxes that will snugly fit around our objects of interest. Um, we also include another line where we wanted to superimpose that text here um, to make it more simple for understanding the raw video feed. For a smoother viewing experience of the video with detections, I actually silenced the print label text render. However, if you want to actually see the type of object detected and the associated confidence score of the object, then you quickly stop this cell, uncomment the line, and then you'll see the actual raw numbers. So without further ado, I'm going to actually run this command, and you'll start seeing this underlying video um, and I'm going to zoom in to make it a little bit easier. And you'll actually see that while the model is not perfect, it is per frame picking up different types of birds um, that I actually saw off the coast of Carmel. And as you can again imagine, because this is kind of a lower quality video and we're looking at it um, inside the context of Jupyter Notebook, you can't really see exactly what the model is like text is saying, but you can see that it's churning ahead just fine. So now I'm going to perform what I just suggested, which is I'm going to actually interrupt this kernel. Don't worry here. Uh, this is purely for the learning experience. And then we're going to uncomment the print label text. And then what's going to happen now is you'll see actually all these outputs. And you'll observe that while it's not picking up all of the birds, um, it is roughly detecting the birds about with a confidence score of at least 0.8 for most of these objects, some of them even hitting 0.97. Um, so it's relatively sure it's a bird. Um, and again, you can see that it varies per output. So I'm going to pass this, pause this now. I don't like that jumpiness because it's refreshing and re-rendering the whole cell every time. Um, but in general, you can imagine how a user can actually easily operationalize these detections by storing them historically into a repository. From there, you could actually even then get a pattern of life and observe trends and activity produced by the output of these object detections. You'll also notice that I ran a few filters here, so you're only seeing the most confident objects because I actually implemented a threshold here um, of 0.8. So if we change that, um, then the behavior will also likely alter. And you'll notice that again here, I only drew boxes, labels, and scores for those high confidence boxes. So feel free to play with this code at your leisure. And for this grand finale, 
I want you to know that you successfully exhibited frames in this grand museum of our Jupyter Notebook. Each frame is sort of like a work of art, and it displays all of our bounding boxes in their glory. When the code chain completes, we then release the video. And thus concludes our fantastical journey through code, where each line weaves a story of mystery, discovery, and even a little bit of playful mischief. Remember that in the world of object tracking, every pixel tells a tale. This is video 19 out of 20 and a beginner series in introduction to AI. By the end of this series, you'll be ready to learn more advanced concepts of AI and machine learning, which will allow you to elevate your career in tech and remain in demand on the job market.